Before we kick off with two very well-known, respected, and drivers of the next generation of technology here, I wanted to remind you of the hashtag. I want you to not feel in any way embarrassed when you're looking at your phone throughout our speech, because I want you tweeting hashtag STYT sooner than you think. Also, please do go to stytbloomberg.com. It's our app, because we want you to be taking part in polls. We want you to be asking questions of your own. So please do embrace the technology at this technology event. And to kick things off with none other, then Frederick and Will, who of course have companies that are well into unicorn status, i.e. they are worth far more than just a billion dollars nowadays. I want to get a sense from the audience of how much you think Europe is the place to build a technology company right now. So I'm gonna ask a poll. I want you to go into your app quickly, heads down, get voting. Is Europe now the place to build your startup? Or is potentially still Silicon Valley where it's at? So at the moment, we currently have Yes, 88% think that Europe is the place to build your startup. That's a resounding event. So Will and Frederick. Will, I'm gonna start with you. As an American by, by culture, but living in London, so we've harnessed you as our own. Why, London was the place to build your company because personal reasons, but how has it proved to be the right choice from a business perspective? Yeah, so I, I started the business in London. And, you know, I'd lived in London since 2004, so had been there quite some time mm. and saw this big gap in food delivery, and ultimately that's why I started the, the company. Um, and it, like I said, initially it was, a, it was a personal thing, but what I found was that it was actually just very easy to start up a company. Um, it was very easy to hire people. Um, people were willing to work, you know, in a small dark room without windows, um, <laughs> you know, initially. So it, it was a really great place to start a business. Eric, what about France? Is it becoming more of a place to build your startup? Because I'm afraid you've only got three unicorns compared to several that the UK can shout about, but you are one of them, and Macron seems to be embracing it as a tech hub. Yeah, I think today it's, uh, the environment has changed a lot. Uh, it's now um, very accepted that uh, you create a startup as a real path for your future, even when you're super young, uh, before the um, main thing was to... Uh, get into a big company and then get a big job there. Uh, I mean, as a as a student from the main top universities or something like that. And now we see that it's becoming very uh, attractive and um, and followed to actually create startups. So it's changed a lot. Uh, to me, creating in France was also because I thought the opportunity was here, and it's still been proven because um, one of our biggest market is France. Mm. Uh, so even though we're in 22 countries today, France is still is a, a very big market for us. So that was the reason why we started here. And so uh, carpooling has been uh, burgeoning in France and it's really, uh, uh, it's really great today. But uh, it's also because uh, on a more personal note, it's uh, an environment I knew very well. So I was able to create uh, a company uh, easier here than possibly somewhere else, mm. even though I had spent some time in the US and, and somewhere else. But um, I think today it's becoming easier to do that because we have an ecosystem. We now have, you see, Station F, which is uh, something which helps companies to, in the early days to actually uh, achieve uh, their mission and, and grow, which was not the case at the time. We, saw, we see also that a lot more investments are coming to France and to Europe. France has raised, uh, for like, the startups in France have raised more than 500 million euros in the first quarter of 2018, which is 70% increase from last year's same quarter. Mm. So it's uh, really uh, changing. And so it's an env environment which is uh, really uh, exploding today. I think we've got some great charts that we can show the audience on how many startups there are gaining unicorn status. You are one of the 18 well over in the UK, and you are one of but three in France. But hopefully that will shift a little bit more in terms of gathering a pace. Will, we were talking just how blah blah is in 22 countries. You are a global operation when it comes to delivery. You just come here in Paris and it's besieged by drivers with, and, and cyclists and mopeds with delivery branding on them. How have you expanded globally? How much opportunity is there still set to grow? So we, we're in 12 countries today. So that is Western Europe, Southern Europe, UAE, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia. Mm -hmm. um, we see this as a mainstream problem, uh, better food delivery, in almost everywhere around the world. So we think it's a huge global opportunity. I would also say, though, that just being in um, France, for example, we're going to be in about 150 cities by the end of June. 
So the opportunity just in one country alone is enormous. And I think that you know, we're both focused on the depth of the opportunity in a certain geographic area as well as expanding into new markets. Yeah, how much of it is it the depth of the opportunity still there for blah, blah? Uh, it's, it, you know, it's always uh, tough to um, estimate it because when we started, people said it would never work. So, uh, and now we have 65 million people uh, using blah, blah, car in, in 22 countries. But uh, what we see, what we can compare is uh, we can still look at the empty cars. For, for me, a car yeah. which is empty with three seats available is opportunity. And if you look at this, uh, we still have a lot of them. Uh, we counted the other day that the number of kilometers um, that we see published on blah, blah, car, even in France where we have a penetration rate which is 40% among the age range 18 to 35, which is huge, like four people out of 10 use blah, blah, car in this age range in France. Even in this country, uh, less than 1% of the kilometer which, has, which are ridden by cars are done with blah, blah, car. So our opportunity here is still like uh, 99% even in France and in the other countries, of course, where we are sooner in the, uh, in the progression, it's even bigger. Both of you are going to chat with President Macron later today, tech for good, as he's calling it, meeting with leaders of technology such as yourselves. Will, how has it been liaising with the French regulators, for example, when you, when you are ahead of the curve, when you are building disruptive technology, you tend to be ahead of the of legal and, and the rules and regulations that are in place. Has France, are you finding it a, a better place to expand as a business? So we, we work with a, a fleet of self-employed riders and one of the, um, my, you know, one of my personal, um, um, you know, issues on this is we've always wanted to end the trade-off between flexibility and, and benefits, right? I was the first delivery rider I still talk to many of the people that you know worked with us. You still drive know. today, right? I, I do it about once every two weeks, you know, just to kind of see what's going on. I do it on a bicycle now, not on a scooter, um, but I'm very much in touch with the riders. And flexibility yeah. is overwhelmingly why people choose this job. Yet we also want the ability to offer people benefits as well. And so we've been liaising with various governments um, around the world. I would say that you know, from everything we've seen so far in France. Um, um, the government is, understands there is a conflict today, and I think they would like to resolve that. So, you know, we've found discussions with uh, the government to be quite productive. Well, I've got a question from the audience, and so do keep them coming. Just on that note of saying how generous you are with your full-time staff members, handing them equity, for example, you yourself are still a rider. How are you looking to treat riders yourself as a company as well? What is it that you're doing to ensure that they're benefiting by your growth and scale? Well, one really key example, it's an announcement we just made. You know, we, we have launched a free insurance product for all our riders around the world, which um, protects them in the event of injury, um, so medical bills, but also income protection um, if they're off the roads. And that's something that um, you know, the team worked really, really hard on. Um, and it's something that you know, we believe very strongly in. Frederick, what, about, what do you believe very strongly that you'll be raising with Macron today? What could he do further to ensure that your business continues to scale both in valuation, in size, and in regional diversity? I would say not only for our business, but for the ecosystem itself. Mm. I think what he's doing right now is really good because it's uh, uh, showing that France is actually fixing the small problems we may have had in the past, and so we're ready for the next decade. So he's doing a great job at this, and I think the most important thing for the ecosystem is to be attractive and to be able to attract talent from anywhere in the world because that's how digital businesses can grow globally. It's by having people who work in those companies who have this world approach, and for, uh, uh, for this, we need people from everywhere to actually help uh, our businesses. Mm. So I think he's been doing a great job, and so when we, um, when we look at what's needed to make a company grow, you need money, for, uh, like our companies, I mean, digital companies need investments, so they need to raise some funds in order to develop faster, because in mm -hmm. digital, like, it goes super fast. And they also need talents. The thing is, it's actually today easier to raise funds than to raise talents, because mm -hmm. the, the money is actually a lot more mobile than talent, and, and so when you want to relocate people from uh, one place of the world to the other, it takes more time and it takes a lot of conviction. And I think uh, that uh, everything that we're doing here to make the best conditions for our businesses to grow is something that will attract more international talent, and this is great for the ecosystem. How is international talent, Will, in the UK at the moment? Unfortunately, 
our UK government is somewhat distracted and perhaps not as focused on the tech ecosystem as the previous government was. How are you seeing the confluence of talent? Is it still easy to get people? Um, we, we hope it um, continues to be the case. You know, if I look at our engineering team, uh, many of them are EU nationals, and it's very important that the government, the UK government, still allows um, people to work in the UK with ease. Now, this is really, really important. For us, what we've had a lot of luck doing is actually recruiting people from Silicon Valley. So those would be, you know, Europeans or British people who have spent time at Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, Google and and they've seen scale. They've seen you know um, um, growth in a way that most European companies haven't. Mm -hmm. And bringing them back to London so they can be part of this ecosystem, help us build this ecosystem is really important. So uh, it's very important uh, to me personally and the company that the government's supportive of those types of moves. Interesting that you bring up how Facebook, Google have seen growth. They've also seen the repercussions of that growth. And in some ways now the focus is on growing ethically, that's, you know, tech for good is what Macron is talking about today. How do you see yourself building, how do you ensure that culture and ethics remain where you want them to be? Uh, so the, the, the topics that will be discussed today are uh, education, work and diversity, which mm -hmm. are like major topics which will be discussed with all the, uh, um, the people uh, flying from, uh, from Silicon Valley and everywhere at uh, Elise today. Uh, and, and in terms of culture, when you grow your own company, what we've done is we've made it as explicit as we could. So we've made sure that everyone had the opportunity at some point when we were, when we were 50 to express why they were loving their job and they were loving working together and building what we were building. And we extracted some principles that we have shared and we've made super explicit. So there on the wall, you have principles like share more, learn more, which is something which uh, um, emphasizes the fact that you can learn a lot from your colleagues and that's how you grow and that's how you cope with innovation which goes super fast as well. So you share everything you know so that you learn more and we collectively learn a lot more. You also have uh, uh, principles like be the member for us which is uh, we do carpool uh, uh, like um, all the time. I did four carpools in the last uh, three uh, three mm -hmm. weeks and so we all do that and it's really important that we stick to our community and we stick to uh, our product. So um, by this kind of things you can create a culture which you make uh, coherent to make sure that even though we have 35 nationalities in the company today, we all act uh, coherently uh, to make sure that we do uh, some, uh, um, some actions which have uh, the power in it uh, from the unity of the team. And so I think this is very important. If you don't do that, then you get a, a culture which is uh, mixed and uh, uh, people will uh, decide differently. Not, not that there is a good or a bad decision. Sometimes it's just that if several people decide differently, then it doesn't work. So uh, you have to make sure everybody is aligned and culture is part of this alignment. Well, we've got a question from the audi audience. Agnes asking, what are the top challenges for your business that you foresee in the future? Is culture one of the top challenges as you scale to ensure that you can stay in the way that you wanted to see it grow? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, it is. Um, like I, I addressed our, our French team earlier this morning and I said, you know, I'm not a professional executive, right? I'm, I'm a founder of a company, I'm a, I'm a builder, I'm not schooled in 20 years of working at a large company. So thinking about how we scale um, internal communications, thinking about how we scale high velocity decision making mm -hmm. is a challenge. Um, it's something, you know, I'm working on with all elements of, of the company, but just not having done it before, um, it, it's, it's, it, it can be daunting sometimes. Especially my role, in the first year I was a delivery writer. That's, I did it every single day for a whole year. Yeah. The next year it's something different. Now six years later, five years later, you know, we were in 12 countries, 500 cities. And so making sure everyone's on the same page mm -hmm. is, is something that you know, I have to spend a lot of time on and have to improve on. Very, what do you see as your key challenges growing? Is it, is it competition? I mean, obviously you're now looking to be within cities, shorter rides, not just the long distance rides, which the area that you dominate, but you have Uber coming in, there's Dara Koswashar, who's gonna be at the event today as well. Is it competition? How do you fend that off? Well, there, there are different things. Uh, for us, we also have to make sure our product is adapted and uh, has the same business model in all countries, which is not the case today. We have several business models mm -hmm. in different countries. Uh, I, I wish we will be able to unify those business models because it makes your, uh, your business stronger and easier to operate. 
Uh, that's one thing. The other thing uh, about uh, competition, I would rather see opportunity because when we go and tackle the uh, short distance uh, rides, so for carpools, what we do is we, will, we address something which actually no one is really addressing today. It's uh, going to work with your car every day and coming back with your car every day to home. Uh, this is not the area where Uber is actually mm. uh, really uh, operating today because uh, we we see that it's only uh, people who take their own cars. I don't know that many people who go with a taxi or with an Uber every day to work and come back home with an Uber. So it's not th this exact competition. It's really uh, people who have their own cars and they could share it for the benefit of uh, less pollution, less congestion, less cost, of course. And so this is what we tackle because more than 50% of the kilometers which are ridden by the cars are done on their way to work and they're not done uh, to make long distances. So right now, we're only, addresses, we're only addressing half of the market we would have with long distance because uh, most of the time when people use their cars, it's actually not to ride for more than 100 kilometers, it's actually just to go to work and come back. And that's what we want to do with Blah Blah Lines, our new product, which is uh, speci specifically made for short distances and uh, daily commute. And so what we see now is that, so we've launched in the, in, um, the first version, uh, first in two yeah. cities uh, in France and now in the Ile de France in Paris. And it's picking up very well. We now have uh, thousands of people who are using it uh, every day, so it's, it's great. Deliveroo has been, many of the VCs will say, it's the fastest growing startup they've ever seen. You're continuing to diversify your business model as well. Not only are you providing food via bikes and scooters, but you're also starting to invest in restaurants themselves. You've been opening your own kitchens, helping people to expand. Do you have to have different business models in different countries? How do you see your future scaling? Well, if fundamentally, the reason we've taken these decisions is because we are a food company. Food is what we believe in. Um, it's why I started the business. And so a few years ago, we had a decision of, to make, which is do we want to go deeper into logistics and offer all various types of things for sale, shoes, clothes, what have you, or do we want to go deeper into food? And so we made the decision to build out delivery-only kitchens to help our restaurant partners expand. We are purchasing ingredients on behalf of our partners to take advantage of, of our scale. Um, and you know, we have introduced low-priced meals as well, um, which I think you've taken advantage of in London, which is great. <laughs> Um, so all of this is, uh, we, we believe that the problems that everyone's um, facing is actually the same in all 12 countries we operate, and we're just going deeper and deeper and deeper into, into that value chain. And is that how you fend off the competition? Because you're going to be sat next to Dara as well, and look, he has Uber Eats. I think the competition's important because it makes us better. I keep it kind of at, the, at, at a peripheral view. What we're really focused on is the size of the opportunity, and it is just enormous um, and we are a food company we're not you know uh, bringing people around in cars either and so we have a singular focus a singular passion and I think that's really really important and someone's just asked for Sylvain asks will there be drone deliveries you're not going into delivery it's going into food <clears throat> you know I think the um, the 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 method um, by which we deliver food um, is you know, in cities at least, is, is always going to be humans for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. I think where drones could be interesting is in a rural area today where we can't service, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, delivery by air could be a compelling option. Keep these questions coming, guys. Uh, Fred, what, what one thing do you think is still lacking in Europe? Is anything, is actually the fact that we've got three unicorns enough in France? Will, is it just time, or do we need a little bit more money, a little bit more expertise? Will we get to Silicon Valley sort of size and shape? Well, I think we're, we're fixing one thing, which is uh, the mindset about uh, going global. So uh -huh. um, for anyone who starts a company today, especially in the digital sector, uh, in, all, in any of the European countries, it's impossible to just think that it will be uh, a national business and yeah. that it will uh, just stay in this country. So now the mindset clearly is if you create something in digital, it has to have some global potential. And so this mindset is evolving along with the fact that we are also making the conditions for those companies to grow better. Um, the other thing that would need to evolve, and it's, it's going to take a little bit more time again, uh, it's making sure that we unify as much as we can in terms of regulation in Europe because um, as a joke sometimes I say uh, 
you know, uh, growing a business in the US is like running a 100 meters race, but uh, growing a business in Europe is like running a 110 meters hurdle race. Because we have different regulations each time we yeah. enter a new country. You have new label laws, new VAT, new anything. Uh, new data protection, why well, it's getting fixed, but we also have this. Mm -hmm. And so, um, or not new, but different. And so as a company, it's already tough to build a business that can scale. And uh, it's already tough to have your market fit and, and build a product that everybody loves. But if you have to adapt everything to every single country, it makes things even harder. Uh, so we're fixing this uh, little by little. There are some uh, initiatives by the EU which go in that direction, clearly. Uh, it's going to take another few years, uh, most probably, but it's uh, what we need to grow faster as uh, digital companies. Will, does doing the hurdles make it actually better to then be able to get into lots of different countries at a faster pace than perhaps the, the sprint runner in the US who's very good at only flat running? I mean, yeah, if you think about the US from a um, business perspective, it is fairly homogenous. And uh, you have a really big market of 350 million people, and you can just kind of plow ahead, as Frederick said, at the 100-meter dash. I think the fact that the markets here are, there's some similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well, puts you in a good position to you know, expand further um, uh, into, into new countries. I think just on, uh, on your point earlier around what sort of things need to change mm. in Europe to really create something that's a rival to Silicon Valley, I think it's just more successes. Yeah. Um, you know, having large exits where um, employees understand the value of equity, where people have seen um, really fast growth. Um, because if you haven't seen it before, you can read about it all you want. It's just a really different thing when you experience it firsthand. Um, and I think that sort of thing would go a huge way in building a strong ecosystem. It begs a the question, therefore, you're both the pinups that we want to be the next big exits and the excitement that comes in Europe. Do you aim to go public at Deliveroo, and, and what sort of time scale? It's, it's not something that we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. We just think about the size of the opportunity. Um, I'm sure you know, some of our investors will have an opinion about that at some point as well. So. Do you think, Frederick, that you will go public? Is that the aim? Well, we, uh, frankly, we don't know. I would do the, sa the exact same answer as Will. Um, the thing is, uh, the way to see an IPO, uh, to me, is uh, it's, a, it's a fundraising. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you do a DPO, like some companies have done recently, like a direct public offer, without Spotify even raising the uh, trend. Yeah, <laughs> uh, without even raising uh, primary capital. But if you think about an IPO as a as a way to raise more funds, it's just a fundraising, which is supposed to be more massive than the previous <laughs> ones. Uh, some companies have proven that it is possible to raise uh, billions without even going public. Uh, now it's been the case for for several companies. Um, so. The, the question would come down to, do we need to raise capital? Uh, so, and then if we do, uh, what is the best solution? Is it a, an IPO? Is it, um, is, is it uh, another way of uh, fundraising? But uh, today it's clearly not at all uh, a topic because uh, it's not a situation where we're, where we're in. We don't need to raise capital at the moment, so that it's not a question. Do you think, Will, the fact that we've had Spotify as a success story, that we've just had Izettle exiting in a slightly different degree. But we, do you think 2018 is a bit of a, the time that we can gloat in Europe? I don't think we should ever gloat, probably. Yeah. But I, I think it's um, super encouraging and super exciting. Uh, and I, I actually was just sitting here. I remember you and I had dinner probably three and a half years ago, yeah. maybe four years ago, yeah. like before we launched Paris. And um, we were talking about the size of the opportunity uh, at dinner in our respective industries. And I think the same thing holds today. You know, we're just singularly focused on that. Well, we're very pleased that you, amid your singular focus, can come here and speak in front of a great audience here at Sooner Than You Think. We wish you both well with the Macron meeting and talking about tech for good. Thank you very much indeed, of course. Founder of Blah Blah Car, Frederick Mazella, and of course the CEO and co-founder of Delivery, Will Shu. Please do give it up for these two gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.